Hi, I'm Alex Mosed, and you're here on Winner Take All, where we talk about the battle that's playing out between big tech monopolies and incumbents in traditional industries. We're going to try and figure out who's going to win. So today we're going to talk about Huawei, not a platform company, linear company, trying to play a platform game. Let's see how that works out. WeWork, we're back on the topic of WeWork and this Powered by We, um, their big growth initiative. Um, Amazon versus UPS and FedEx. And what's going to happen there? The platform ETF called Plat. Um, and what's the difference between exchange versus maker platforms and this one-to-one versus one-to-many dynamic? And then lastly, retail. We've talked a lot about the kind of impending doom of the retail industry oversupply on uh, square footage, lots of cheap debt that's helped to extend what should have been a lot of bank, a lot of accelerated bankruptcies that have been able to be prolonged uh, somewhat prematurely. Um, so let's jump on in. Huawei. Huawei's Mate 30 may launch without the Play Store and Google Apps. The com- this is their newest phone. It's called Mate 30. Um, The company is pushing ahead with the launch of its new Mate 30 smartphones, even though they won't come with Google's official Android operating system. And by extension, you don't get all the uh, premium Google apps. So that's Maps, Search, YouTube, Gmail, um, Google Voice. I mean, the list goes on and on. Ways. The list goes on and on and on. No bueno for Huawei. And, um, but, you know, they're going to launch this phone in Europe. Um, the Mate 30 is slated for reveal on September 18th, but we don't know when it'll actually come out. The company announced its plans for its own operating system, Harmony, earlier this month, but many are unconvinced it'll be feasible to rival Android, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Yeah, this, this phone's dead on arrival. I mean, no one's buying this phone. Who's going to buy this phone outside of China? Okay. But in Western, mar- Western markets, I don't think any, I don't know, even know if they have much of a presence in the U.S. with their phone business anyway. But in Europe, they had, a, they had 200 smartphones. I mean, I think they still do have 200 Huawei smartphones in Europe. Um, and that business is gone. It's straight up gone. Um, and this phone in Europe, it's dead. I, I think this is more just marketing and buds and PR and kind of posturing than it is them actually expecting to release this thing. I don't, I mean, they're going to announce it um, in a couple of weeks, but it wouldn't make any sense for them to come out with this phone. I don't even know how they're going to launch this phone because they don't, I don't know what operating system they're going to use for. I just don't even know how the phone will function. It's, it's a non-starter. And why is that? Let's unpack that because... Platforms only have two winners, one or two winners, never a third winner. No one wants to be the Windows phone. On exception, there can be some industries that are different. We've spoken about how you have essentially three winners in the video game console industry. Those are development platforms, right, between um, Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo. And we've discussed why that is with Nintendo really having very strong games of its own brand to help propel and, and make that um, console of interest to consumers. That's what we would call essentially um, kind of acting as a producer where they have their own supply, right? As opposed to relying as heavily on an ecosystem of other third-party game creators. We've spoken about it in retail where you have um, one or two dominant overall general kind of e-commerce winners in Amazon and I think uh, Walmart as the number two behind Amazon. And then you have vertical specific winners, right? So we're seeing Farfetch in the luxury goods space. We're seeing Goat and StockX in the sneaker uh, consignment industry. Um, You're seeing a variety of kind of vertical specific businesses in the e-commerce marketplace uh, sectors. But generally this rule of only one or two winners, and and there's just no way that Huawei is going to be able to rival um, iOS and Android. They've said that they're going to make this Harmony operating system. It's just not going to work um, because you're not going to be able to convince an ecosystem of third-party developers to build for Harmony. And you're not going to be able to play the chicken and egg game, right? How do I convince consumers to buy a phone with an operating system that doesn't have any third-party apps? And how do I convince developers to make apps for an operating system and a phone with no consumers? 
The answer is you don't. Even if you have the technology for the operating system, you won't be able to play the chicken and egg game and get to critical mass with consumers and producers. Um, the difference, these are both development platforms, the video game console and the smartphone industry. Yes. But when you look at the amount of fragmentation and the amount of video game creators that are out there, it's much more consolidated on the supply side in the video game console world, which means that if you have very strong brands and your own game titles acting as a producer in Nintendo, then that actually has a much more profound impact because supply is more constrained in the video game console world than, say, in the world of apps and smartphones, where it is so fragmented and so wide and so broad. There are millions and millions of apps. You, Huawei, you just can't buy enough companies of, you know, if, if you went and bought all of the top you know, top apps on the app store and you bought all those companies, A, you'd probably bankrupt yourself and B, you're just not going to be able to do it. And because Google and and Apple and just other large tech monopolies own those, you, they're just not up for sale in the first place. It just, you can't do it. You can't act as a, as a producer in the smartphone business um, to try and get over that chicken and egg game. There just, I, there isn't a strategy I see that lets you overcome uh, this really kind of death blow, at least a Huawei smartphone business that's come from the uh, Trump administration. Let's talk about some more kind of inflated hot air. Um, WeWork. We really kind of grilled WeWork's S1 a couple weeks ago when it came out. And this was one of their big growth initiatives called Powered by We. And it's basically like a white label service offering where WeWork will go and design your office space and help, I think, manage it for you if you're a large enterprise. They're kind of trying to bring like the WeWork ethos to enterprises and help you do this as a service. <sighs> I don't know. You know, they have this like WeWork living thing. And let me throw a concept out there. Okay. WeWork is a linear company. They're not a platform company, despite all the times they were use the word platform and explain that they're a technology company. They're absolutely not a technology company. Let me give you an example of something really cool and I think innovative that WeWork could do, but you just don't see them doing it. What if WeWork goes and starts to buy buildings, like really buy the landmark buildings? You know, they've got a big IPO to justify. And then you get some anchor tenants in there, right? You get some really cool, maybe some tech companies in there or some really interesting, you know, um, like blue chip kind of companies that are the key tenants in this space. And now you're really delivering upon this kind of their whole ethos is kind of like bringing this ecosystem together. And that's why they say they're a tech company, because they have all these like this ecosystem and all these service offerings that they help the startups that are renting space from them kind of connect within the ecosystem whatever. Who, who do the startups want to be around? They want to be around big enterprises. They want to be around funds and money. So could you just physically, literally try and do this ecosystem play? Could you go buy a building, really prominent building that has a really prominent tenant in it or a VC firm uh, or a hedge fund or a private equity firm? Um, or, you know, someone that's of interest to a startup community. And now you can literally start to create these communities and ecosystems, but doing that physically rather than through this kind of like smoke and mirrors technology thing. Okay. I think you could still deliver on WeWork's purpose, but just stick to who you are and do it through real estate. You're a real estate company. Okay. So how could you deliver on the ecosystem through real estate? Um, and I think that's where it gets really interesting, right? Like I remember when Google bought the uh, Port Authority building here in, in Manhattan and it, it actually took them probably a handful of years before all the companies, um, you know, it was a massive building. It was a multi-billion dollar deal. The thing I think is as long as an aircraft carrier. It's huge. And so it wasn't just Google that was in that building. So Google was, I think, the biggest tenant in the building. Um, but there are still many other companies in that building. And I remember when they bought that building and all of the companies that had their leases in that building cherished those leases. All of those companies would have happily renewed those leases at a huge premium just so that they could kind of be around Google. Um, and whenever they would bring someone 
like a client or a prospective employee to the building, it has this aura around it. Let alone if you have any potential business dealings with Google, right? Um, which is obviously additional value. But um, just the kind of coolness and awe factor. What premium would you pay on? Would you pay an extra 20% premium? I guarantee you there's a lot of startups with a lot of funny money from VCs that would happily pay a 20, 30, maybe 50% premium if they can just be close to the action, literally in the same building as the dominant tech company in their industry or the dominant, you know, financial services company or fund in their industry, right? Um, deliver on this, but stick to who you are. Don't try to be something you're not because investors are seeing through it. And to that effect, I think we work uh, valuation just got a huge devaluation. So now uh, large institutional investors are rejecting the company's $47 billion valuation and may value the company at less than $25 billion if an IPO proceeds. Now, there, now there's actually people saying they should just scrap the IPO. Here's the biggest loser in all of this, and it's unfortunate. It's all the employees that joined WeWork in the past one to two years. It's all the employees that had options that are basically underwater at this $25 billion threshold or lower. And that's a shame because those people were, were sold a dream. Um, and look, I mean, they need to take personal responsibility as well to kind of understand what is a fair valuation and, and where the company could go. Um, but, it, you know, in large part, it's that, that ownership is, is more so on WeWork than the employee, I would say. And unfortunately, I think this is really this is really bad for WeWork because now they have what should have been a great event for them to get more liquidity and capital. And now their employees can get liquidity uh, on the shares and options that they hold. Now it's a crisis because now they've got easily hundreds or thousands of employees who are now underwater on their options and have been grinding away for years. Um, in hope of getting this big exit and having a nice kind of nest egg at the end of this, uh, the end of this tunnel. And that just all went up in smoke. So I don't know. I don't know if this is kind of karma where I feel like WeWork was kind of playing a lot of tricks um, and karma's coming full circle now. Uh, or, you know, maybe if they'd played it straight from the get go and just been a little bit more honest and upfront, not played as many games as I feel like they were playing. Um, I don't know. And, you know, I don't know if it, that would have been any different. It's obviously a hypothetical scenario, but um, it's really unfortunate for, uh, for the team and the employees at, at WeWork because they're great people. They work very hard. They're very smart, talented people. But a lot of these things are just out of their control. And the founders are going to get rich. They already are rich. Hell, they're already giving themselves, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> leases and buying the buildings, the CEO. Um, okay. I, I'll stop. Amazon shipping empire is challenging UPS and FedEx. I feel like this article could have been written like three or five years ago. I give FedEx credit for canceling their contracts with Amazon. Granted, it was less than 2% of Amazon's business. It wasn't a material contract. I challenge UPS to cancel their contracts with Amazon. That's really what needs to be happening here. UPS needs to be making this very difficult for Amazon to compete because absolutely... Ask yourself this, in the next three to five years, will Amazon launch a direct competitor shipping service to consumers? Let's take a poll. I'm absolutely betting yes. There's no reason that Amazon doesn't do it. They literally are doing this for themselves. This is literally the script that the company has been doing for the past 20 years. Look at AWS, okay? Amazon built all of these server farms, all this infrastructure so that their web pages would load the fastest and they had to build these server farms all around the world um, and handle huge scale to just be the best e-commerce website. And then they said, oh, well, why don't we open this up and let other people rent out our infrastructure? So that's linear initially. It was linear. AWS was linear, right? It's just kind of infrastructure as a service. And then the app marketplace came and then Amazon platformized it, right? And, and let developers build apps 
that make AWS more powerful, provide more utility, more functionality for the business customers that are using the storage, all these kinds of things. Um, this is the Amazon way. Basically, build this thing for ourselves and then open it up. And now what that means is this actually just becomes stronger for me, Amazon, right? Because now if I can just be shipping more packages, I have more subsidies basically to build out a stronger shipping network, which is now going to let me have hey, more next day delivery, which we've heard a lot of buzz about, that ever since Amazon launched next day delivery on millions of products, has a direct correlation to, guess what? Sales. Um, and, uh, and the stock market has absolutely rewarded Amazon for those investments, even though it resulted in um, a lot of pain and they missed on earnings, but they beat on growth. So as we've seen with tech monopolies and platforms that are public, in general, the rule of thumb is that the stock market's going to reward growth over profit, um, particularly for public platform stocks. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, if you're a UPS and you say Amazon's a competitor, why am I letting them, why am I helping my competitor? Um, yes, I know it's a material account, but I don't think this is, this can't be more than 5% of UPS's business. Otherwise, they'd have to disclose it in their in their uh, earnings. So it can't be that big. Yes, I'm sure that'll have some short-term pain for UPS, but long-term, the what you can do to widen the gap between UPS and Amazon and FedEx, I'm sure Fred, the founder and CEO of FedEx, I'm sure Fred's calling up David Abney, the CEO of UPS, and saying, David, cancel this. Stop working with them, right? I'm sure David's thinking about this right now. Um, it's the right thing to do. They're your competitor. Cancel. Make it hard on them. This is business. It's not, you know, it's not personal. It's business. So other incumbent industries under siege by guess who? Amazon. Um, we've spoken about how, you know, th these low interest rates have basically um, helped prop up industries that should have had bankruptcies or experienced a lot of pain much sooner than we have seen the pain. So we've seen retail bankruptcies over the past few years, but I've really tried to pull together some information here that would help illustrate what's really going on um, in the retail industry. So let's start with just, just how much retail square footage we have in the United States. Okay. Look at this chart. You have 23.5 square feet per people in the U.S. So that's just saying, what's the population of the U.S.? How much retail square footage is in the U.S.? Boom. Put those two numbers together. Look at where we rank compared to the rest of the world. It's not even close. So, I mean, look at China. 2.8. Granted, they have billions of people. But China didn't have all this incumbent infrastructure, i.e., retail stores and malls um, like we had in more developed countries like the U.S. Instead, China basically kind of leapfrogged and went straight to the internet. Alibaba, as we've said, Alibaba has about um, three times the amount of GMV than Amazon does. I think Alibaba has over $600 billion in GMV. Those are U.S. dollars. And Amazon has $277 billion in GMV. So, right. So there's just much more throughput, right? The Chinese are just buying more stuff online. Um, and, that, and so that kind of makes sense, right? The, there wasn't this um, trained motion of going to a store or a mall and that just behavior. Uh, there was less kind of hurdles there. So, and as we've seen with uh, Pinduoduo, just blanketing the, the rural environment with group buying in rural China, you're just seeing a lot of innovation there that, that they don't have this existing behavior to have become accustomed to go to retail stores like the US or Europe um, has. So keep this Australia number um, in mind here, 11.2. I'm going to come back to some Australia data here, okay? So now basically what this article is talking about is that um, PE firms are buying retail companies, loading them up with debt. The PE firm takes out their money and pays themselves high management fees, basically kind of strips the company dry, makes their... IRR. Um, and then, you know, a lot of these companies go belly up 
and then the creditors, um, who are the uh, the debt holders that the PE firm brought on, they get stuck with the bill, or basically they get stuck with taking a huge haircut on the money that they lent to these retailers. I mean, look, I can't blame the PE firms. It's just smart because I and I really fault. Who do I fault for this? I mean, ultimately, you got to fault the lenders for not understanding that they're lending to retailers and in the mid, you know, in the 20, 2015, right? 2014, you're, you're lending to retailers. How can you expect for these numbers to continue? They're being propped up by your debt, cheap debt. Um, and, you know, eventually something's going to have to change here and that's, they go belly up and you lose your money. I do think the brokers and the banks that are facilitating these loans should take some responsibility as well because the bankers know that they're selling a hot potato and they're getting paid nice fees. And I don't think they've really done probably the best job informing these customers that the loan they're about to issue um, could probably go belly up in a couple of years. But hey, it's neither here nor there. Basically, What's happening? This is U.S. department store total sales. Boom. You notice a downward trend. Obviously, okay, this was kind of pre 2008. You see the biggest sinking, but this is just continuing to decline. And there's nothing that's going to stop this trend from declining. It's just going to continue to decline. Um, marketplaces are going to continue to have a more commanding share of. B2C retail in the US. I think right now you have a two and a half trillion dollar uh, retail mar- industry in the United States. Amazon has over 10% of that, $277 uh, billion dollars in GMV. I'd say net net, you know, if you got maybe another you, net net, you're probably between three or four hundred million dollars. Um, and it's a wide range, but you're in between three or four hundred million billion dollars in e-commerce. Uh, in the United States. So you're between, you're say around say 15-ish percent, maybe 15 to going on 20% over the next three to five, you know, maybe two to three years really at this point. Um, It's substantial amount of the industry, especially considering the amount of square footage in the US, right? So these things just don't line up, right? Does that make sense? Now, this is Australia. I couldn't find numbers on this in the U.S., um, but this is Australia retail net margins. So net profit as a share of total income in Australia. Now, Australia was the number three country on that list of retail square footage per person. E-commerce penetration in Australia is nowhere near as strong as it is in the United States or Europe for that matter. Okay. So you would assume that Australia's numbers should look better than the U.S.'s numbers. But look at Australia's numbers. This is not good, folks. This is from 2009 to 2010, around, say, 5% for non-food of retail net margins, net profit margin. Now it's sub 4%. I mean, those are drastic numbers. I mean, that's a huge change. Um, not to mention where it was kind of before 2010. So it, this number is just going to continue to go down. There's nothing that's going to change that. And um, what is happening is that these retailers are able to extend these loans. And uh, eventually, you know, you're not going to be able to extend the loans anymore. But but they've been able to extend the loans. That markets have been favorable for the past few years. Um, interest rates have been very low. And so they've been able to kind of just keep this gravy chain rolling and renew these these uh, these loans, but but that's not going to continue. And you're going to start to see a lot more bankruptcies in retail, which should have come a long time ago. Um, and the debt is really the reason that these things have been propped up for a while. But these things are just in very big conflict with one another. It just doesn't it doesn't work. Last topic here, you know, I talk a lot about different types of platforms. The, the book goes into a lot of detail about different types of platforms. There are basically two overarching categories of platform model. And we wrote this article a long time ago. It's one of our, our top articles, Exchange versus Maker Platforms. And basically, the thing to take away here is, let me zoom in here, boom. Um, so this is from the book. And you can see 
Exchange platforms. So these are two overarching types of platforms. The biggest takeaway here is exchange platforms and their network effects are more one-to-one. What does that mean? Think about a service marketplace. Think about a product marketplace. Think about a communication platform. I'm really, the produced value that I'm consuming as the consumer is really um, finite, right? So if I'm getting in an Uber, I am consuming that Uber's car and time. If I'm buying a product on Amazon, I'm buying that specific product. If I'm communicating with someone on WhatsApp, then I'm sending a message specifically to someone or to a group. Even social networks are in here, right? So Facebook has a limit on how many friends you can have. I think it's maybe 6,000 friends. So that produced value is capped. It's meant for a specific or a finite number of users, more often than not one user, but it could be a few thousand on a social network. But the difference here is then if you look at maker platforms and just understanding the network effects. So maker platforms are one to many. It's not finite, right? If I make an app for iOS, if I make a video for YouTube, I want millions and millions and millions of people to consume that same piece of produced value. I don't need to make different value for for each different group. No, I'm I'm making one piece of value and that is re- it's digital. So all of these are kind of digital value. Doesn't mean you can't have digital value from exchange platforms, but all the maker platforms absolutely have digital value that's being created and it can be consumed many many times over. And actually that's what you see is the litmus test for when a maker platform really hits critical mass is this idea that you create a celebrity out of nothing, right? That you've channeled your network effects so well that you have created a star that was not a star before. So what do I mean by that? Think about Angry Birds. Um, Think about that game developer, I think Rovio, um, that made Angry Birds and was propelled to app stardom and fame. And there's movies made about Angry Birds and like, uh, you know, plush toys made from Angry Birds. And it was the hottest item at Christmas all from a video game, all from an app developer. And those network effects were able to compound themselves so strongly that that this audience and this uh, fame that attributed itself to this app developer on the app store and, you know, ecosystem um, created this celebrity out of nothing. And you've seen this in many other platforms, right? On YouTube, you see so many YouTube celebrities like PewDiePie, like Joe Rogan, like, um, That seven, the kid who's now seven years old, but started, I think, when he was four years old, opening presents. And now millions of people watch this seven year old open presents. You could say it's awesome or it's horrible or it's saying some really weird things about our society. Nonetheless, YouTube is making a celebrity out of this seven year old, and I think he's making millions of dollars. Well, his parents are, I guess, for now. Um, You see this on Twitch with Ninja, and then Ninja went to now Microsoft's. Uh, version of of Twitch. And um, you're seeing this all over the place on the maker side, this creating a celebrity when you really hit critical mass. So um, I know I get asked a lot about that. Now, last last note here is let's look, let's look a little kind of retrospectively at Platt here. Um, on Wisdom Tree's site, they have this interesting chart that can do a comparison. So let me take away the comparison. This is... Um, this is performance of Platt since inception, end of May. Um, you can kind of see it's, it's, it's performed pretty well. Now, if you compare this with the S&P 500, but kind of separate these, it's, it's really interesting to kind of see how over the past now, roughly three months, a little bit more, these things either go up or down in, in concert or, or, or not. The orange being the S&P 500 index, the blue being plat. And you can kind of see this separation that started uh, back in June. And it's been able to essentially, they've kind of traced each other where a lot of the things that have been moving the markets are things like trade, um, things like the economy, the U.S. economy, the strength of the economy, where that's going. Is the Fed going to um, cut interest rates or, or, or stop doing quantitative tightening? These kinds of macroeconomic things that have kind of affected both of these things somewhat similarly. Um, There's also been things like regulation on tech monopolies that has uh, hurt things like Platt more so than the S&P 500. But at the same time, what you see is that um, Platt is able to bounce back much faster. 
and and the platform businesses are probably less affected by some of the macroeconomic concerns because these are growth plays. And these companies are going to continue to grow. If anything, I would argue that actually in a downturn, they're able to actually grow much more aggressively because the incumbents are more capital constrained when going into a recessionary period. I'm not saying we're going into a recession, and I actually don't think that we're going into a recession. That said, even when maybe there is some slowing, um, you still are able to essentially continue on that growth path because you have the access to capital, the platform conglomerate status that a lot of these companies are achieving, and you actually have competitors that actually somewhat kind of have their hands tied behind their backs a little bit more than the platforms do. Net net, it looks like they've actually come close, maybe within about uh, fifty basis basis points of each other or so right now. But I think long term, what you're going to see is that you're going to see platform business models collectively absolutely outperform the S and P five hundred and the general stock market, right? Are the most dominant business models of our time going to outperform the average over a five to 10 year period of time? Absolutely. And on that, I'll leave it. Thanks for joining us on Winner Take All. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.